This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 24, for broadcast on the 25th of February, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, a new record for binary brown dwarfs, Australia's Optus 11 satellite to fly on the new Ariane 6 rocket, and a new study has shown that long-term space travel can change the way an astronaut's brain works. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a rare pair of brown dwarfs that have the widest separation of any brown dwarf binary system ever seen. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, shows that the two brown dwarfs are in a binary system located some 130.4 light years away, known as CYS J014611.20-05080 AB. The pair orbit each other about 19 billion kilometres apart, which is around three times the separation between the Sun and Pluto. Both are members of a rare class of blue L dwarfs, with a secondary brown dwarf in the system being exceptionally faint. What makes this so interesting is that the gravitational force between a pair of brown dwarfs is much lower than for a pair of stars with the same separation. That's because brown dwarfs are so much less massive than stars. And so a wide brown dwarf binary system is more likely to break up over time, making this pair of brown dwarfs an exceptional find. The observations were made using an infrared spectrometer on the Keck telescope in Hawaii and showed that the two brown dwarfs are of spectral types L4 and L8. One of the study's authors, Adam Schneider from the U.S. Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station and the George Mason University, says wide low-mass systems like this are usually disrupted early in their lifetimes. So the fact that this one has survived until now is remarkable. Brown dwarves are failed stars, objects which don't have enough mass to sustain the core hydrogen fusion process which makes stars like our sun shine. However, some brown dwarves do fuse deuterium or lithium under the right conditions. Brown dwarves fit into a category between the largest planets, which have about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smaller spectral type M red dwarf stars, which are usually about 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or about 0.08 solar masses. While some brown dwarves are born as such, others start their lives as spectral type M red dwarf stars, but they then burn off enough mass during their evolution to cease the core nuclear fusion process of stars turning them from red dwarfs into brown dwarfs. Now, these objects are still hot enough to be radiating energy. That's how they were detected. Binary systems are used to calibrate many relationships in astronomy, and so this newly discovered pair of brown dwarfs will provide an important test for brown dwarf formation and evolution models. This is Space Time. Still to come, Australia's new Optus 11 satellite to fly on the new Ariane 6 rocket. And a new study has shown that long stretches of time in space can change the way an astronaut's brain works. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, NordVPN. So how much time have you spent online this week? How much time have you spent online today? Well, if you're anything like me, it's a lot. And that's where NordVPN comes in. It can help make that time a little bit more private. NordVPN offers a private and secure way to access the internet. With over 5,300 servers in 62 countries, you can be sure that no one will know what's on your computer or phone. And because of their new Nord Linux protocol for faster connections, everything takes less time too. But don't just take my word for it. Grab the offer. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So connect, run a speed test and see for yourself. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. I know I was. And if you do have any issues, no worries. NordVPN have a very quick and responsive help team at your disposal. But you can find all this out for yourself by trying them today and take advantage of our special space-time offer. 
Grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary. Or use the code Stuart Gary at the checkout to get a huge discount off your NordVPN two-year plan, plus one additional month for free and a bonus gift. And if you decide that it's not really for you, that's okay because it's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. And did I mention it's their birthday, so they're in the mood to look after you as a space-time listener. That URL again to grab our special space-time deal is nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary. Or just use the coupon code Stuart Gary at the checkout to get our great price and bonuses. And of course, I'll include the link details in the show notes and on our website. And now, it's back to the show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The new Ariane 6 rocket has been chosen to launch Optus's next telecommunications satellite. The Optus 11 will fly in the second half of 2023 from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana using an Ariane 64 version, which is equipped with four strap-on solid rocket boosters. This report from ESA TV. At Europe's spaceport in French Guiana, the newly built launch complex for Ariane 6 is ready. Currently, the European Space Agency, ESA, the French Space Agency, CNES, and Ariane Group are conducting combined tests between rocket and launch base. With these final tests and the recent inauguration of the launch pad, ESA's new Ariane 6 launch vehicle is now entering its final phase of development before its inaugural flight. Despite COVID restrictions across the globe, the development of Ariane 6 has continued And over the last few months, we have seen much activity in French Guiana and ESA member states. In March 2020, the Ariane 6 launch complex was closed due to COVID-19. A lot of efforts were put to resume the activity in safe situation for the workers. With the better knowledge of the pandemic and the implementation of the uh, safety barrier, the activity resumed. Since that period, A lot of work was performed and many steps are behind us. All the buildings are now complete and we are installing the system inside. We are in in the test phase of this system. But the work has not only continued in French Guiana. Across ESA member states, the assembly and testing of Ariane 6 stages is ongoing. Soon the Ariane 6 upper stage will be tested in the newly built DLR test bench in Lampolzhausen, Germany. The tests will simulate all aspects of flight, including stage preparations such as fueling with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, and draining the stage's tanks. Tests were also performed in Fosse-sur-Mer in France. Here, the so-called umbilicals, which are used to fuel the launch vehicle, were tested, and their release from the rocket at liftoff was simulated a critical phase before and during launch, as through this system, the fuel tanks on both the upper and lower stage of Ariane 6's central core will be filled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. An explosive combination, and the release of the fueling system needs to be spot on. For the upper stage, the system is composed of two arms connected to the mast of the launch table. One arm is for the liquid oxygen, the other arm is for liquid oxygen hydrogen. They are connected to the upper stage to fill the tanks and disconnected at liftoff. Comparing to RN5, we have also two arms, but these arms are disconnected before the takeoff, before the liftoff. In this case, for RN6, they will remain connected to the launcher till the liftoff. We will open these arms very quickly in order not to interfere with the launcher during liftoff also two doors that will be closed during the movement of the arms in order to protect the connection, the interface with the launchers. Leading up to Ariane 6's inaugural flight, combined tests will be performed at Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. During these tests, the launch base with the launch pad will interface with the real elements of the rocket. This allows ESA to test all systems, validate operations and procedures, and run various simulations connected to real-life launch operations. With these tests, ESA takes another step forward in the development of its sixth-generation Ariane rocket. 
What makes RN6 unique, it's clear it's a strategic workhorse for Europe uh, for its freedom of action of tomorrow. Uh, today we have RN5, tomorrow we'll have RN6. RN6 will be much more modular, we'll have an enhanced uh, portfolio of, uh, of missions and all this for a lower cost for the public sector. That's really fundamental. In addition to that, we will also have the opportunity to launch crucial missions with a European family of launchers. We will have only European developed launchers launching Galileo, launching Copernicus with the Vega C, but also for science missions, for exploration missions, a real new opportunity. And in that report from ECA TV, we heard from ECA Europe Spaceport Technical Manager Tony De Santos and ECA's Director Daniel Neunschwender. Optus 11's KU band footprint will encompass all of Australia and New Zealand, as well as the Pacific and Antarctica. The 3,000 kilogram spacecraft is being built by Airbus Defence and Space. Its digital processing and active antennas will allow the creation of several thousand beams. The spacecraft will carry enough fuel for a 15 year lifespan. This is Space Time. Still to come how spaceflight rewires an astronaut's brain cells. And what's the best thing to do with your telescope if you're in an area with lots of light pollution? All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study has shown that long stretches of time in space can change the way an astronaut's brain works. The findings, reported in the journal Frontiers of Neural Circuits, looked at the brains of 12 astronauts just before and just after their spaceflight and found changes in the neural connections between several motor areas of the brain. The changes were still visible seven months after returning to Earth. Researchers say the study shows that people's brains are affected by spaceflight, effectively being rewired to cope with different movement strategies required for living in microgravity. Scientists already know that spaceflight causes muscles to atrophy and affects human vision by changing the shape of the eyeball. This is Space Time. Still to come, we look at the best way to use your telescope if you live in a light-polluted area. And later in the science report... The invention of a new material that's stronger than steel and as light as plastic. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Australia has some of the best dark sky conditions in the world. And the Southern Hemisphere also provides the world's best astronomical viewing. Not only does the spectacular vista of the southern night skies provide an unrivaled panorama of the stars, but the lack of light pollution means your ability to take in those amazing views is second to none. But there's a problem. You see, most Australians tend to live in heavily populated cities and urban areas. And just like everywhere else in the world, there, light pollution becomes a major problem. And so a night sky watching always means packing up your telescope and going for a trip into the country. But as Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, explains, there is an alternative you may not have considered. What you can do these days, instead of having a telescope in your backyard, so maybe you might live in a big city where there's a lot of light pollution or something, or maybe you live in the part of the world where you can see some things in the night sky, but you really want to see stuff in the sky that's, in, that's visible from another hemisphere. So if you live in North America, but you really fancy seeing what's in the southern sky or vice versa, then you can set up a, a remote observatory system. Or you can use a remote observatory system. Now, there are ones out there that are already set up. They've been going for years, and you can rent time on these telescopes. Uh, companies have set up whole fleets of telescopes in certain locations, and you can get on the Internet and send commands to these telescopes to say, take a picture of this or take a picture of that, and, uh, and bingo, it just happens, right, without you having to buy the telescope. So you can do that if you want. And that's Is that like really Swoop? Well. Yeah, that's right, yes. There, there, there are things like that. There are quite a number of them, and they're, they're, they're situated all around the world. And they've got some really big, nice telescopes that you can use with fancy cameras and things. And I get, I get a lot of pictures sent to me by um, 
people using these telescope systems, and they're just spectacular because uh, the equipment is really good. You know, you're talking about thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar telescope systems that most people just can't afford to buy, but you can afford to rent it for an hour or something. It's not that expensive. But there's an alternative even to that these days, and that is if you do have a backyard telescope and um, you find that maybe the light pollution's got too bad or something or you want to see a different part of the sky, you can actually pack up your telescope system with its cameras and its computers and everything like that and ship it off to this place in Chile in the, that they've set up in the Atacama Desert, which is very high, very dry, and almost never has clouds and, and basically never rains. So it's the most amazing astronomy environment. And they will unpack your telescope and everything and set it up there. Your telescope, they'll set it up there on, on a concrete block, and then you just remote control it from home. It's really quite amazing. And lots of people are doing this now. And, and it's not as hard as you think. If you've got your telescope already set up working at home, and it's one of these computerized ones that you can sit inside in comfort and send commands to it down a cable or Wi-Fi or something, then you can actually pack the whole thing up, ship it off to Chile, set it up there, and just take pictures. It might be uh, daytime where you are, but it's nighttime there, so it's taking pictures. And after dinner, you can go and download all the pictures that it's taken and say, wow, look, that's my telescope, thousands and thousands of kilometres away, taking pictures of things that I can't see from here. So uh, it's a really interesting option that a lot of people are taking up, and we go right into it in detail in the magazine, and we, sh we basically one person's experience of how they did it um, and how they found it to be far easier than they thought it was going to be. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing is easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has found that around one in three older adults infected with COVID-19 in 2020 went on to develop at least one new medical condition that required attention in the months following the initial infection. That compares to around one in five people who were not infected with COVID-19. The findings, reported in the British Medical Journal, are based on health insurance plan records to identify 133,366 people aged 65 and older in 2020 who were diagnosed with COVID-19 who were matched to three non-COVID comparison groups from 2020 and 2019 and a group diagnosed with a viral lower respiratory tract illness. In the COVID-19 group, 32% went on to develop a new or persistent condition, which was 11% higher than the 2020 comparison group and the 2019 group. The study found that those who had COVID-19 were at increased risk of developing a range of conditions, including respiratory failure, fatigue, high blood pressure and mental health diagnoses. Almost 5.9 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it first spread out of Wuhan, China. And the World Health Organization says the true death toll is likely to be at least double that amount, as some 420 million people have now been confirmed infected with the disease globally. There are new warnings today that global methane concentrations have soared to nearly triple pre-industrial levels and that global warming itself may be behind the rapid increase. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are based on observations by the U.S. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. They show that atmospheric methane concentrations have now rocketed past 1,900 parts per billion. The data shows methane emissions began a sudden and mysterious rapid rise around 2007. There are growing fears that global warming has created a feedback mechanism which will cause ever more levels of methane to be released, making it even harder to stem rising temperatures. The problem is methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, at least 28 times worse than carbon dioxide emissions. Chemical engineers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, have created a new material that's stronger than steel and as light as plastic. 
The material is described as being between four and six times as strong as bulletproof glass. It's created using a novel polymerization process that can easily be manufactured in large quantities and could be used as a lightweight durable coating for car parts or cell phones, or even as a structural component for bridges and buildings. Polymers, which include all plastics, are made up of chains of building blocks called monomers. These chains can grow by adding additional molecules to their ends, eventually forming three-dimensional objects through processes like injection molding or 3D printing. However, unlike other polymers, this new material is two-dimensional and self-assembles into sheets. And that's been impossible to induce until now, because if just one monomer rotates up or down out of the plane of the growing sheet, the material will begin expanding in three dimensions, and the sheet-like structure will be lost. Celebrity interviews in recent times have generated an interestingly corresponding rise in so-called body language experts who will, usually for a price, give you their two cents worth on what every twitch in movement means. Unfortunately, it usually turns out they're almost always wrong. While there are some general traits in body movement which most people can interpret, the subtle non-verbal gestures which so-called body language experts like to pick up on is just stuff they've made up to give you the impression they know more than you. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says, Studies have repeatedly shown that body language cannot accurately be read like a book, especially when trying to detect deception. And when specific gestures are associated with specific meanings, and when this is implicitly or explicitly presented as scientific, then it begins to fall under the umbrella of pseudoscience. It depends on where you take it. I mean, yeah, there's also things like someone blinks a lot means they're lying. This cropped up recently during the Meghan Markle interview with Oprah Winfrey, and a lot of people sort of analysed uh, Meghan's responses and body language and what she was doing to the nth degree. And there are some basics in body language which you, as you say, defensive or, or overly intimate or whatever. But the trouble is taking it to a scientific level to suggest that one particular body movement or a tick or whatever can be applied, can mean one particular thing is where this whole thing goes off the rails. It is body language is an indicative thing that probably we all use to a certain extent. Someone comes close, someone steps away, has implications for you and how they're reacting to you. But to actually suggest every little movement of the body has a meaning, I raise my little finger when I'm having a cup of tea, that says something. That uh, is where this is sort of just totally unreliable. But body language as a study has been around for for a while. It's often used by amateurs to assess celebrities. Royal family cop it quite a lot, but a lot of other people do as well. And uh, if you put it to the test, it doesn't actually work as far as you know. But yeah, you're going to ask someone, are you lying when you're blinking? Are you sort of nervous? Nervousness perhaps, but does it imply that this is a pretense or this is whatever? It's getting down to the fine details of the literal details that where it falls apart. Unfortunately, these days, because everyone has access to videos of people and everyone has access to social media and to other sort of claims, etc., that this sort of stuff is now spreading. So that once upon a time when someone suggested Meghan Markle might be lying or might be sort of uh, being very open, suddenly it becomes fact on social media. And then everyone quotes it as fact, as long as, as we see with every other sort of false information that's on social media. So it's an area which is uh, so-so. To, to a certain extent, certainly we each apply it personally, but as a, as a science, it doesn't rate. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. 
just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 